A sweaty, energetic, wild crowd jumps to the beat of the music, thundering from the speakers. On stage is one of the world's biggest rap stars, Travis Scott, urging them on. It's November 5th, 2021, and after a year and a half of the coronavirus pandemic, many in the audience are letting loose for the first time in a long time. More than 50,000 visitors are crowded in the sea of spectators, singing and shouting along to the loud music. But some are screaming for help. They're stuck. They're squeezed between the security fence, the stage, and tens of thousands of people. It's too crowded to even lift their arms. Some lose their balance and fall between the hundreds of stomping feet and bouncing bodies. No one can do anything. It's too crowded. All they can do is hope they don't fall themselves because if they fall, they won't get up again. This is Mayday a show about disasters and accidents. In this episode, we talk about Astroworld 2021, when 10 young festival goers were suffocated and trampled to death in the middle of a concert. The hosts of this episode are Luke Wellen and me, Maya Nalani. Mayday Season 1 is made by the podcast company, Cast. Madeline Eskins has a few days off. She switched her shifts at the hospital several weeks ago because this weekend is Astroworld, one of the country's biggest music festivals for hip hop, soul, and R&B. Madeline hasn't missed the festival once since it started three years ago. After a year long coronavirus break, the festival is back in Houston on November 5th, 2021. Madeline and her boyfriend, Sam, bought tickets as soon as they were released. It was a bit of a splurge. $300 per ticket is no small expense when you're a parent of a young child. But both Madeline and Sam are big fans of Travis Scott, the Houston-based hip-hop star who founded Astroworld and the festival's biggest draw. Madeline is a nurse at one of Houston's largest hospitals, where she works in the emergency department. It's a very stressful job, and after a year and a half of the coronavirus pandemic, many of Madeline's colleagues are completely burnt out. In her spare time, she usually focuses on horses, rodeo horses to be precise, but there hasn't been much spare time to speak of in recent months. So a weekend off full of concerts and parties is just what she needs. Madeline and her husband get in a car on Friday afternoon, leave their young son Ryder with the babysitter, and then drive through Houston's rush hour traffic to Energy Park, where Astroworld takes place. It's downtown, but Houston is a very big city, so you need to get there early. Hip-hop star Travis Scott started Astroworld three years earlier, in November 2018. And it's immediately a big deal. The schedule is packed with big names from hip-hop, rock, R&B, and soul. And it goes well. The festival attracts tens of thousands of people. 
Next year, it gets even bigger. 50,000 tickets sold for a two-day festival. But the year after that, in 2020, it had to be canceled. The coronavirus pandemic does not allow for large crowds. And Astro World is no exception. But in 2021, it's back on. The U.S. state of Texas deemed it safe to hold a festival again. And so Travis Scott announced to his more than 45 million social media followers that Astroworld is back on November 5th and 6th at NRG Park. Travis Scott has a rowdy reputation. His concerts tend to go wild, with mosh pits and passionate fans. In many cases, Scott tells people to be as wild as possible, something he has gotten in trouble with the law for in the past. At a gig in New York, before the coronavirus pandemic, Scott told a fan to jump from a balcony into the audience. On two occasions, he has pleaded guilty to incitement at his concerts. But his fans don't seem to care. On the contrary, it fuels the rumor that Scott's concerts are wild, free-spirited and unbridled parties, where the audience is as involved as he is. That rumor follows him to Astroworld. Besides Scott himself, the festival is organized by a company called Live Nation. They have been plagued by legal scandals for many years before the festival. Among other things, they have repeatedly failed to train their staff adequately, neglected worker safety, and needed better water supplies and adequate information at their concerts. In several countries, concert deaths have been directly linked to Live Nation's lax preparations. Two companies have been hired to staff the festival. Medical care will be provided by Paradox, and security company CSC will provide the guards. Both these companies have been sued several times for inadequate training of their employees, which visitors to previous concerts say has led directly to injuries and deaths. When Madeline and Sam park near Energy Park in the late afternoon, they're greeted by a messy scene. A few hundred people have already rushed into the restricted areas, pulling down fences and knocking over metal detectors. And when Madeline and Sam arrive a few hours after the rush, the fences and gates are still on the ground. So it's possible to enter the area without passing any security checks. But that doesn't deter Madeline. Travis Scott's gigs are always a bit messy. What she doesn't know is that several people have already been injured while standing in the way of the crowd. When Madeline and her husband enter the festival area, they feel the loud music blasting through their bodies. For them and many others, this is the first big crowd they've been in since the pandemic began. And it's clear that people are ready to let loose. There are two stages in the area. The main stage is empty until the evening, when Travis Scott will perform there. But on the smaller stage, many big names in hip-hop and R&B perform throughout the day. Madeline and Sam decide to skip the last few gigs on the small stage. Instead, they try to find a good spot in front of the main stage, three hours before Scott is due to go on. They're not the only ones with this idea. There are already thousands of people crowded there. Usually, there would be more room in the audience area, but this year's Astro World is different. Travis Scott's concert will be live-streamed on Apple Music. So there's more infrastructure in place than usual. Opposite the main stage is a platform for camera equipment. From it, two sturdy safety grids cut straight through the audience area to the stage, with an open passage between the grids so that the camera has a clear view of the stage. 
Another similar grid crosses the first one in the middle, forming a cross of security barriers in the middle of the audience area. This means that if you enter the audience on one side of the stage, you must go back the same way. You can't go through and get out on the other side. This will be significant later in the evening. But it's not something Madeline is thinking about right now. She has been to many concerts and is used to crowds. She's happy to be here with Sam. Around 8.30, the last show on the small stage ends. Several thousand people make their way to the main stage. There's only half an hour until Travis Scott starts, and it's important to get a good seat. But as the crowd rushes from the small stage, things go too fast. Several visitors later testify that they had no control over their own movements. A sea of people moves with such force that it is only possible to move forward. Those who try to step aside or stand still quickly lose their balance from all the pressure. Some fall down and receive several blows to the body before getting up. But none of the hired guards or medics try to stop the crowd. As the crowd reaches the main stage, there is suddenly a lot of pressure towards the front and the safety barriers. Madeline and Sam are stuck where the pressure is most intense. In a split second, they go from being a little crowded to not being in control of their own bodies. And the pressure doesn't let up, even when everyone from the small stage has arrived. Because almost everyone wants to get as close to the stage as possible. For Madeline and Sam, and many others around them, it is now so tight that they can barely lift their arms. They are stuck. And the pressure soon becomes even more intense, because now a countdown appears on stage. A giant clock counting down from 30 minutes until the concert starts. This motivates many of the more dedicated fans who push as hard as they can to get to the stage and stand where there'll be most dancing and rowdiness. Madeline knows from experience that there can be a bit of a rush when a major artist is about to take the stage, but she is also a trained and experienced nurse, so she knows the pressure she is now starting to feel on her body is downright dangerous. And Madeline has one more problem. She is shorter than many in the audience. People are pushing into her from all sides, and her whole upper body is starting to feel compressed. Now, Madeline starts shouting for people to make room, and she is having trouble breathing. Sam, standing next to her, does his best to help, but there's not much he can do. The clock on stage is getting close to zero. As soon as the clock strikes zero, a powerful bass line echoes over the huge crowd. Pyrotechnics send huge flames into the dark sky, and Travis Scott rushes onto the stage. He immediately launches into one of his biggest hits, and those who have crowded in front of the stage let loose. In several places, mosh pits open up, each one only increasing the pressure on the rest of the crowd. Madeline screams as loud as she can so that Sam can hear her. She shouts that they have to get out of there. Sam yells back that he can't move. They can't get free. Now, Madeline starts to feel wobbly. She's struggling to breathe. There's so much pressure on her chest that it can't expand properly, and she's getting short of oxygen. Sam tries desperately to make room for her, but it makes no difference. Everyone around him is pushing back. Now, people are getting worried and panicked, and no one wants to give up what little space they have. Madeline asks Sam to tell their little boy that mommy loves him. Then, she faints, but she doesn't fall to the ground. There isn't enough room to fall. 
Her body is held upright by the crowd. Sam looks around desperately and manages to make eye contact with a guard walking in the security corridor. The guard understands the gravity of the situation, but can't get to Madeline. Somehow, Sam manages to free his arms and lifts his girlfriend as high as he can. People around help, and together they lift Madeline's body to the guard. As the guard receives Madeline and carries her to the paramedics, Travis Scott still hasn't finished his first song. In a very short time, the medics on site are overwhelmed. Dozens of people drag themselves to the medical tent for treatment. Some are carried there by others. The injuries vary. Some have been trampled by the crowd. Others have been punched in the face, and many are on the verge of oxygen deprivation from the overwhelming pressure. But there are not enough medical staff on site, even less equipment. On top of that, many of the caregivers have not been properly trained and do not know how to help. Madeline wakes up in a chair. There is a bottle of water in her lap, and she slowly realizes that she's in the VIP area. The fact that she never fell to the ground when she fainted in the crowd is probably what saved her life. The hospital tent has become so full that the nurses are putting people wherever there's room. Once Madeline has had some water and taken a few deep breaths, she feels much better and starts helping the nurses as quickly as she can. She tells them that she's an emergency nurse and points out a couple of people who are in particularly bad shape and whose pupils are starting to roll back. Together with an overwhelmed nurse, Madeline starts CPR. Once the situation is stabilized, a guard comes up to her. He tells her that she needs to come with him. There are many others who need help. As Madeline is led to the injured, the crowd gets worse. In several places, people start losing their balance as they try to get over fences or away from the stage. And when one person falls in such a dense crowd, it is almost inevitable that others will fall as well. In some places, people are now falling over each other in large piles. Some who are trying to help are themselves pulled into the pile of terrified people, desperately trying to get a grip and get free. Barely 15 minutes of Travis Scott's concert have passed. Several guards around the stage notice what is happening. They try to radio that there is a critical situation in the audience. But the music is so loud that their calls cannot be heard. They try to lift people out of the crowd. But in many cases, people are so trapped that it is impossible to get them out. About half an hour into the show, Scott suddenly stops and points to a person in the audience. The music stops and Scott calls out that he sees an unconscious person who needs help. Guards rush to help the concert goer and get the person out. Scott then calls out to the crowd, asking everyone to raise a middle finger if they are okay. Tens of thousands of middle fingers fly into the air. But at the same time, several hundred people are shouting as loudly as their compressed lungs will allow, trying to get Scott to stop the concert before they get crushed. Their cries are drowned out by a chorus of excited fans. And when the music roars out of the speakers a few seconds later, the crowded, frightened people realize they're on their own. Now people are climbing onto the camera platform, trying to get the attention of the guards or cameramen. They point to the most crowded, dangerous places in the audience and shout that people are dying. The concert must be stopped but no one on the platform seems to take them seriously. Anyone who climbs up is quickly turned away. Their calls for help ignored. Before Madeline even reaches the medical tent, 
she's greeted by dozens of injured people. Many more are exhausted and terrified, but not in danger. She notices that several people in acute danger are not getting the help they need, while people with minor injuries are being treated extensively. She realizes that many of the paramedics do not know which patients need to be prioritized. She does her best to help those in greatest danger, but it's an overwhelming task. More people keep coming in and calling for help. Both in the medical tent and in several places around the sea of spectators, people are lying without or with a very weak pulse. Many visitors are trying to help and several with medical training are reacting to the fact that the hired staff on site are not providing the right kind of care. These visitors are now doing everything they can to help those with the worst injuries. One man later describes how he finds a young woman without a pulse, whose face has turned a grayish blue. When he calls a nurse and explains that they need to get a defibrillator there immediately, he is told that there is only one such machine in the entire festival. One defibrillator for over 50,000 visitors. It is now a few minutes past 10 in the evening. Travis Scott has been playing for an hour and has already interrupted the show three times to point out people in the audience who he notices need help. But he seems unaware of how serious the situation actually is. Several times he urges his fans to let loose, to be wild. And now a guest suddenly appears on stage hip-hop superstar, Drake. The excitement in the crowd reaches a whole new level. For a little more than 10 minutes, Travis Scott and Drake perform together before ending the concert at around quarter past 10. Madeline's boyfriend, Sam, makes it out of the crowd unharmed. He stays in the same place until the concert is over and then slowly makes his way out but it's several hours before he and Madeline find each other. The phone service at the venue quickly becomes overloaded and no calls are getting through. Travis Scott and Drake go to an after party in Houston and celebrate together until the early morning. That's when they learn that at least eight people have died at Astroworld in the crowd right in front of them. That number will rise to 10 in the coming days as two more people die from their injuries. One of them is the young woman whose face had turned gray-blue. Her brain went without oxygen for too long and her life could not be saved. The second victim to die in hospital is a nine-year-old boy who was trampled to death when he lost his balance in the sea of people. At least three of the victims die 15 minutes into the gig as people fall over each other in a large pile. These three end up at the bottom with no air under all the bodies. The causes of death of the victims at Astro World on November 5th, 2021, vary. A few die from suffocation. Others are trampled and crushed in the crowd. And others still die from cardiac arrest. Their hearts stop working from lack of oxygen. When it becomes clear how many people died and were injured, the rest of Astro World is canceled. Live Nation offers a refund to all visitors. However, several months later, visitors will still find it difficult to contact the company. In addition, it turns out that a clause was written into the refund, which absolves Live Nation from liability if concertgoers accept their money back. Travis Scott offers to pay for all the victims' funerals, but several of the victims' families refuse his offer. They perceive it as insufficient, and that Scott is mostly trying to buy himself out of guilt. 
The people affected by the tragedy want to see someone held accountable for what has happened to their loved ones. But that will prove to be more difficult than one might think. The very next day after the disaster, the festival organizers, the security company, the audience, and the Houston police start blaming each other for the tragedy. The police were alerted to a potential crown disaster about 30 minutes into Scott's performance, but decided not to interrupt it. At first, they explained the decision by saying that it would have led to a major riot. Later, they changed the story, claiming that the decision to cancel had to be made by the organizers or Travis Scott himself. Live Nation, on the other hand, places the blame firmly on the police, who they say are responsible for the safety of people in Houston, whether they're at a fenced-in festival or not. The head of the security company CSC in Houston chooses to blame the entire tragedy on the visitors in the audience. He says that they behaved irresponsibly and that many deaths could have been avoided if people took care of each other instead of focusing on getting to the stage. Many people, both police officers and visitors, blame Travis Scott for the incident. They argue that his encouragement of the audience to continue to riot and behave as wildly as possible made the concert much more dangerous. Scott defends himself by saying that he could not possibly hear or perceive what was happening, but that he still interrupted the show three times when he noticed that someone was unconscious or in a bad state. Many of the victims' families, as well as injured and traumatized visitors, will later join together in several different lawsuits against Travis Scott, Drake, Live Nation, CSC, NRG Park, and the medical company Paradox. In total, affected festival goers are demanding billions from those responsible. The court proceedings take a very long time. And in June 2023, the news broke that Travis Scott will not be facing criminal charges. Madeline explains in several interviews what she thinks is behind the disaster. A perfect storm of bad circumstances that combine to lead to the terrible outcome. A wild and partly irresponsible crowd. Poor communication between organizers, police, security and performers on stage. And a medical company that did not properly train its staff. She explains that she has been to a lot of concerts and seen a lot of crowds before but she has never before felt that she is in danger. Seen people collapse in the audience or die. This has been Mayday, about the 2021 Astroworld disaster. The hosts of this episode are Luke Welland and me, Maya Nalani. The script was written by Carl Hager. Mayday Season 1 is made by us at the podcast company, Cast 